Good morning. If we could start this morning, may, may we turn to hymn number 45. Hymn 45, sing verses 1, 3, and 4. Standing as we sing. says that uh, among the Texas Baptist men who are down there serving, there uh, is one fo fellow who's just uh, left to go back to Washington State, his home, so he's come from there. They have a group from North Carolina that just arrived last night, and uh, there's a group from Arkansas that are their cooks uh, for the feeding units, 
and Brad himself is overseeing two shower and laundry units like the one we had out here last summer, so he's got his work cut out for him. So I promised him we would uh, continue to remember him in prayer, which, which we will do. But on this first Sunday of November, um, it's a good time to be thankful to God as we prepare for our Thanksgiving season once again. So I wanted us to take just a moment and allow a few of you uh, to verbally express your praise and thanksgiving to God. Uh, I think it's acceptable to Him that we do so. So this morning, uh, let's take a moment and just let two or three of you uh, share with us uh, what you're thankful for uh, on this Lord's Day. So who would like to be first? Thank you, Greta. Well said. All right. I'm thankful for these members of this church and how that anytime you need prayer, you know that they're praying for you. Amen. Amen. I'm thankful for the repair that seems to be working well. Okay. That's good.
guess we got a gym just down the street. I didn't, I didn't realize that there was a sign for trail. Alright, if we can find our places, may we continue our service by turning to hymn number 680. Number 680, singing all the verses. Standing as we sing.
reading this morning from the book of Psalms, Psalm number 100, beginning with verse 1. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving, and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him, and bless his name. For the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. May we just pray, pray for a moment. Dear Lord and Heavenly Father, we do thank you for all of your blessings to us, for the way that you sustain this world and, and uh, you're involved in all that uh, takes place. We thank you, Lord, that uh, we can have trust and confidence in you, and we thank you that because Jesus lives, we can face each new day. We ask, Lord, that you will be with uh, those that are unable to be with us this morning. We pray that you'll be with David Smith and, and uh, his condition, that you'll help him to uh, improve in there, and for Dawson as well. And we ask for uh, for Weldon, and pray that you'll help him as he continues to recover. We ask for any others that are not able to be with us today, pray that you'll work in their lives. And we ask now that you'll bless and remain of the service, and we'll pray in Jesus' name, amen. May we continue our worship by turning to hymn number 320, number 320, verses 1, 3, and 4.
Just thank you for this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Among the things that I, I am so thankful for uh, would be these ladies that uh, play our instruments every Sunday and Merton leading us in our singing of praises to God. So don't you appreciate them so much? Well, I have a text for you this morning. I hope you'll turn with me in your copy of the scriptures to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And we will begin reading in verse 16 and read to the end of the chapter, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, beginning with verse 16. Be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not put out the Spirit's fire. Do not treat prophecies with contempt. Test everything. Hold on to the good. Avoid every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Brothers, pray for us. Greet all the brothers with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. It was obvious that uh, the Apostle Paul had in mind for this letter to, to be read to all of the uh, saints, all of the people who comprise the church in Thessalonica. So this is a word that the Apostle has written by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, uh, not just to individuals, but to a church as well, to a whole uh, fellowship of believers. Uh, I have a question for you this morning to ask um, how, how you're doing with understanding and accomplishing the will of God. That seems to be a major concern, I think, for all of us who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. We want to know God's will, and uh, we want to do it to, to the best of our ability. I find, though, that uh, in my own life, uh, understanding God's will has oftentimes been uh, giving attention to the major issues education, uh, career, uh, job, spouse, house, uh, those bigger things that uh, life uh, puts before us that we 
have to make decisions about. However, the will of God is much more encompassing than that. God has a will for us daily. God has a will concerning even the smallest kinds of things. And our text today brings out some of those daily uh, experiences of knowing and doing God's will. Familiar words to all of us. Rejoice evermore, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks. And so Paul says, this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. However, as we look at these things, uh, it almost seems to me as though he might be charging us with doing the impossible. There are three impossible things that the Bible clearly says are God's will for our lives. I mean, be joyful always. How can one be joyful in tragic circumstances? Pray without ceasing. Surely we cannot be on our knees uh, in an attitude, atmosphere of prayer constantly. We have work to do, things to accomplish. And how can we give thanks for everything in the circumstances that are so troublesome and difficult for us to even endure? And yet we know that God would not command us to do things that are totally outside the possibility of our accomplishing it. So a couple of things I think we have to recognize as we look at this. One is that, um, G, that uh, Paul uh, gave us this qualifying phrase for all of this. This is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. And so that's what makes all the difference in the world. You know, an unbelieving person need not pray about what God's will for my life is. There's only one answer to that for a non-Christian, that is, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Then the other details come into play. But for the rest of us that are, that are in Christ and are saved and, and we abide in him, then we know this much that Jesus said, the things that are impossible with men are possible with God. So if we are in Christ and accompanying that, the fact that Christ is in us, then it puts a whole different perspective on these impossible things. Let's look at them then briefly and understand maybe how that comes into play. Number one, be joyful always, or as the old version says, rejoice evermore. Uh, understandably, Paul's not talking about just being happy or joyful uh, in, a, in a silly kind of way with a smile on your face at all times, we recall his own experience. The experience of Paul himself, you know, when Paul and Silas were in Philippi and uh, they had been uh, arrested there and brought before the magistrates and severely beaten and then the jailer was charged with guarding them securely and so they were thrown into the innermost prison and then they were put in chains and there were guards at the doors. And that was their circumstance. And yet the Bible tells us in Acts chapter 16 that uh, at midnight, while their backs were still bruised and bleeding from the flogging, their feet uh, in stocks and probably their hand in chains, and yet uh, Paul and Silas were singing praises to God. So much uh, with such a loud uh, uh, loudness that everybody else in the prison was hearing them. And so they were rejoicing even in those circumstances. Or we could think about uh, the whole group of our Lord's disciples soon after uh, he had been crucified and then raised to life and then ascended into heaven. They were out preaching the word of God in the temple. And so the Sanhedrin sent soldiers and had them arrested and brought before uh, this judicial court. And they too were flogged, beaten. And then they were charged uh, severely, don't preach in this name anymore. And then the Bible tells us that they departed from that scene 
rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for that name. So there is a deep-seated kind of joy that is undisturbed by circumstance. The joy of knowing that God is our God, that we are his sheep, the sheep of his pasture, and that we have a blessed salvation and an eternal life that nothing can take away. And so in that, we can have a deep kind of joy even when the tears might fall. Secondly, Paul says this thing, which might be considered impossible, but he says pray without ceasing or pray continually. And most uh, people seem to take that as to be in an attitude of prayer always. I think even that might be difficult uh, for some of us, uh, for all of us probably, because we have other things that occupy our minds and we get involved in one thing or another and forget all about uh, uh, the Lord or praying or whatever. I think uh, maybe the best way that we can take this, as some scholars will put it, and that is to be in an attitude of recognizing God's presence and to never give up on prayer. Is there an illustration that we can look at in this kind of situation? And I think there is. That of Daniel. You know the story of Daniel and the lion's den. Daniel made it his practice to go before the Lord three times a day. He was advisor to the king. You know, had a very high position. He was responsible for a tremendous empire at this time. He needed God's help. Three times a day he went to his home, opened his window toward uh, the east, toward Jerusalem, and got down on his knees and prayed. You know the story how Daniel's enemies were so jealous of him that uh, they, they somehow persuaded the king to issue a decree that for 30 days nobody would pray to any god or any being other than the king himself on pain and penalty of being thrown in the lion's den. Well, Daniel, having heard about that, uh, did nothing different from what he always did. Still went to his room uh, three times a day and got down on his, on his knees and prayed giving thanks to God, the Bible tells us in Daniel. So, uh, his, uh, his enemies uh, reported it to the king, and because this was the law of the Medes and Persians, which could not be altered, the king had no choice but to, to let the sentence be carried out. And you know the rest of the story, how uh, the angel of the Lord shut the mouths of the lions so that he was not harmed. You know, if there's anything I think that the church needs today more than anything else, it must be a never-ending, ceaseless, never-giving-up-on prayer. Uh, it's obvious that there, there are things that, that we need and that can only be done by the grace of God in response to prayer. If we want God's power... If we want God's peace, if we want God's presence, if we want God's miracles, God's strength, then we have to pray and ask for it and never give up on praying. Uh, Jesus taught us that time and time again to, to, uh, to keep on praying, to be persistent in prayer, and told us how to pray. Because if we don't do that, then all that we are able to accomplish is simply what we might do in our own strength, in our own way, in our own ingenuity, and we being human are so limited in that respect. So then he says also, give thanks in all circumstances. Um, always give thanks for in every situation. That may be the easiest thing for us. That might be our specialty. We can always find something to be thankful for. But um, even so, you know, what we, what we do normally is just give thanks for the good things, the things that by our perspective uh, are an advantage to us, which may mean that we would 
probably be very much like the little boy whose parents were training him and, and you know, giving thanks before their meals and how to uh, pray a blessing on their meal. So he was called on one day to pray and, and he bowed his head and he thanked God for the dog and the cat and, uh, and for his bicycle and uh, all, for all of these kind of things. And then his eyes squinched tightly shut, but one eye opened just a little bit. He began to thank God for the meatloaf and the potatoes and the beans and the corn, but not the broccoli. And I, I guess maybe that's kind of the way we are. We thank God for the good things. We're not so sure we thank him for some of the things that don't seem to be so advantageous for us. Those of you who went to, uh, to hear uh, the Corey Ten Boom presentation will remember one of the things that was said there about how Corey's sister Betsy reminded Corey that they needed to give thanks to God for all things, even when they were... Uh, in that terrible Ravensbrück uh, prison for women in Germany. And so uh, Betsy said, we, we need to thank God for the lice that infested, you know, their beds and their clothing and everything. And Corey didn't think they could be very thankful for lice, but they thanked God anyway. And then not long after that, they discovered why they should be thankful even for lice, because that is what kept the brutal German guards out of their part of their living quarters and their dormitory. And so they found that they could even be thankful uh, for such a thing as lice. There's always something, you know, we can be thankful for even in the most difficult times. And Paul says this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. So three impossible things that are made possible because we are in Christ Jesus. But then he goes on to talk about three imperative things, three imperatives that follow that beginning in verse 19. The first of which is this, he says, uh, do not put out the Spirit's fire. In other words, quench not the Spirit, as the King James Version puts it. And so important that is because it's by the Spirit's presence and power that we can do all these other things, these three seemingly impossible things. The presence of the Holy Spirit is the power within us that enables us to understand uh, God's will and God's word because he's the one that inspired God's word. And the Holy Spirit can be a, a burning fire in our hearts that gives this the impetus to follow and to do God's will and to rejoice and to pray and to be thankful in all circumstances. But if we put out the Spirit's fire, and we can do so. If we, if, if we, can, uh, we can quench the Spirit within us, and, uh, and we do so by deliberate sin, by disobeying what the Spirit has said to us or what we've understood of God's will, we can do so by, uh, by just uh, ignoring God's teaching and God's Word or, or not going to it regularly to read and study it by, by apathy, just unconcerned about what the Spirit of God is saying. Paul said, you know, to his young friend and, and co-worker Timothy, Timothy, he said, fan into flame the gift of God that is within you. And that's what we must do. Fan into flame the Spirit of God, not put it out, not uh, throw water on it. You know, I think we Baptists have typically shied away from the overt activity of the Holy Spirit um, because probably we're a kind of controlling people that don't ever want to feel that we are out of control. And sometimes when the Spirit of God moves freely among a people, a church, or even in a person, he moves in ways that we don't ourselves have control over. And, uh, and so uh, that's not always comfortable for us. I'm afraid we Baptists are poor uh, for the fact that we've not allowed the Holy Spirit maybe to work in ways that he would like to have worked in our churches. 
So quench not the spirit, he says. Secondly, do not treat prophecies with contempt. It may be that in the Thessalonian church, um, as it was, we know in many of the churches, in Corinth and other places, there's evidence from Paul's letters, that in their worship times, oftentimes God's spirit would speak to people and, uh, and give to them a word from the Lord, and so they would, they would stand up and share that word in the church. Paul said two or three can do that, not more than, than that, uh, because uh, we don't want to have chaos with too many trying to speak or trying to speak at the same time. And it may have been that in the church at Thessalonica, there were those who were um, professing to have had a word from God about the second coming of Christ. And some were saying it's already happened. And that made others anxious that they had missed it. <coughs> Pardon me. So Paul said, uh, listen to uh, what is truly a message from the Lord and don't treat that with contempt. If we were to bring that down to a modern day um, application, I think it might be in the sense of what the world itself, for the most part, the way it looks at the preaching of God's word, the proclaiming of, of God's message, it's just pretty much discounted by the world. It's mocked and made fun of by Hollywood. Every preacher you see in a movie just about, unless it's a Christian movie, it is made out to look like some kind of fool, a buffoon. You know, he just really doesn't know what's going on. And so the world does that kind of thing, treats uh, God's word, the prophetic word of God, as being nonsense, uh, not applicable to our lives. Paul says it's important that uh, you understand when God speaks that you need to take that very, very seriously. And then finally, in verse 21, he says, test everything, or as the King James puts it, prove all things. And, and probably there isn't a more needed word for our day than that very one. There's so much information out there, so much false teaching, uh, so much uh, dangerous philosophy and false doctrine that permeates our world. And so Paul says you've got you've to test everything, compare it to God's written and revealed word, um, take it to the Lord in prayer. And with that testing, then he says, two uh, resultant actions will take place. Number one, you will hold on to the good. Number two, you will avoid every kind of evil. Or as some say, as some texts say, every appearance of evil. Evil, you know, can take so many different forms. And Jesus warned us about a time when men would call that which was good evil and that which was evil good. And we're certainly in those kind of times right now. So Everything that uh, comes uh, to mind or uh, that, we, that we deal with in the world needs to be put to the test uh, of the Lord, of his word, and of prayer so that that which is good we hang on to with all uh, firmness and diligence. Uh, stand firm for that which is true and good and, and avoid every appearance of evil. I fear very much that uh, we as believers today get drawn into um, the evil that's in our world. And some of it is made to, to be presented in such ways that it almost appears to be good. But our common sense tells us and our understanding of God's word tells us that uh, it is evil in disguise. And therefore we test it, we prove it, and we react accordingly. I'll never forget a seminary professor that I had who actually taught Greek, uh, but in his class we oftentimes had a lot of discussions about uh, moral issues and things that were happening in our world. Even that many years ago, uh, things like seemed to be you know, going uh, in a downward spiral in America 
And, and I always remember um, his advice to us as young seminary students. He was a man who really loved baseball. And we often uh, times talked about baseball if we could get him off on that track uh, to avoid having to talk about Greek verbs. But anyway, this was his, uh, his good sense, I think. He says, if it's in doubt, call it out. In other words, uh, if there's some just inkling that this might not be God's will for me, this might be treading in a, in a dangerous spot, then don't do it. If it's in doubt, call it out. Just is plain enough and, and common sense enough. Okay, so here we have then these three impossible things made possible in Christ Jesus. We have three imperative things. And then he concludes here with three assurances. And, and I'm so glad that he included this here. Uh, a prayer, uh, a couple of prayers, and then, and then a promise. But verse 23, he says, May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. Now, it seems, as we've said, that the Thessalonians were especially concerned about uh, the coming again of Jesus. Was it near? And would they be ready? And how would that take place? We say that because every chapter of, of First and Second Thessalonians ends uh, with some reference uh, to the second coming of Christ. And so maybe these people were overly concerned about that, but probably rightly so, because Jesus said, you don't know when it's going to happen. And, and he's already said to us in just the previous chapter, chapter 4, that uh, the dead in Christ will rise first when Jesus comes, and then we who are still alive and are left will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. So there's not going to be time to, to think about it, to go home and pack your bags or, or to go and correct some wrong that's been done. There won't be time for that. And so what Paul is praying here is with the assurance that God himself, the God of peace, will prepare you because he will sanctify you through and through. And then he adds this, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And this assuring uh, truth in verse 24, the one who calls you is faithful and he will do it. Will we be ready for that glorious day uh, when the heavens are torn open and on the glorious uh, majesty of the clouds of heaven, Christ comes? again, calling us unto himself. Will we be ready for that moment? Uh, it might be something we would be concerned about. But Paul says, know this, that God is going to sanctify you through and through. Your whole spirit, soul, and body, he will preserve blameless until he's coming. But if that be true, you know, it does require one thing from us, our willingness to cooperate with God as he sanctifies us. Meaning that we need to do these things. Be joyful, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances. Don't put out the Spirit's fire. Listen to the word in the prophetic teaching of the word and test all things. God requires our cooperation in that he can work in us that which is pleasing unto himself, and present us ultimately before the Father as blameless so that we can take our stand again. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. But he wants our cooperation to the fullest extent. That's God's will for us in Christ Jesus. Would you pray with me? Lord, sometimes we get so preoccupied with uh, the day-to-day -day affairs that we do forget that one day you are coming back and uh, we will stand before you. 
and all of your holiness and glory. When we pause to think about it, Father, we, we realize we desperately need the sanctifying power of your Holy Spirit and the grace of our Lord Jesus to cleanse us and make us holy and enable us to stand before you blameless, joyful, thankful, persevering, and ready to meet our Lord. Father, today we have so much to be thankful for, and yet we realize there's so much more that we need to strive for. And these imperatives that Paul has given to us, and these seemingly impossible things that we know are made possible only in Christ Jesus. Help us to abide continually in him, to find and do God's will in the little things day by day as well as in the major things that are so uh, important, it seems. God, give us strength, give us guidance. Lead us this day by your Holy Spirit that we might respond as your Spirit leads. We pray this in Jesus' name.